Brett Kugelnass. Um, he's from the Energy Impact Center in Washington, D.C. In, in the United States. And the title of his talk is True Reversal of Climate Change Requires Nuclear Energy. And there are no slides for this, so you can look at Brett's face instead. I look upon a sea of heroes at the dawn of the greatest challenge yet to come. In the face of adversity, you stand here united. Greater than your parts is the sum. Looking forward may seem dire, uncertain of what the future may entail, but history will sing. Protecting climate with nuclear, humanity did prevail. So today, I will do my part by illuminating the chinks in our armor before we climate warriors march into battle. I will challenge the accepted paradigms of both climate change and nuclear energy across three types of error, evaluation, mathematical, and communication. But I will also share with you a vision, a path toward climate victory. The first error we make regarding climate change is evaluating the priorities of others through our own experiences. For most of the world, energy is far more than just a convenience which can be sacrificed at will. Energy is embedded in food, in medicine, in buildings. Energy moves goods and people across the globe. Energy is in everything you need, and energy is at the core of what you love about a prosperous world. Restricting energy, on the other hand, with high costs or any other disincentives means real hardship is spread throughout every part of life. The poorer you are, the worse it hurts. This is why we subsidize all types of energy, including dirty ones, as the power has such a profound impact on quality of life. For most of the world, especially the poorest, less access to energy could actually hurt them more than climate change will. And they would feel it immediately, every day, in everything they do. The second climate error we make is mathematical in nature. Who here believes that if we were to eliminate all new emissions across every sector, that that would fix climate change? It won't even slow it down. You heard me correctly. Zero emissions globally in every single sector. Electricity, transportation, agriculture, industry, heat, and you would not even notice a difference. The atmosphere would continue to capture extra heat at the exact same rate that we are adding extra heat today. Deploying low carbon technologies is the equivalent of punching a small hole in a sinking ship instead of a large one and claiming that you're helping the problem. Low carbon is not part of the solution. It further accelerates climate change. Not only are carbon negative technologies necessary, they are the only thing that matters if what we really care about is the solving climate change. Now, here's where math is important. Since every power source has an embedded carbon footprint, and every carbon capture technology requires a certain amount of energy, we can already narrow down to which technologies are even mathematically capable of powering negative emissions. Reversing the carbon clock, by definition, will require incredible energy abundance and absurdly high energy density. It turns out there's only a single source of power that can simultaneously, one, scale to global levels of consumption, two, power the removal of the last 200 years worth of carbon, and most importantly, three, fully account for its own compounding emissions. And that one source of power is nuclear. The third climate error we make is how we communicate the challenge and the opportunity ahead of us. Let's say that you're mobilizing a nation to go to the moon. Would you deliver speeches about wanting to blow up your rocket shortly after takeoff? Because that's what the Paris Accord states. 
The targets set by the Paris Accords wouldn't even slow down climate change, since limiting new emissions does not limit temperature rise. If every country met every goal set, there would still be accelerating warming, widespread ecosystem destruction. Billions would lose their homes and likely lives. That's aiming for climate catastrophe. Scientists may argue that this is a step in the right direction, but that is not only mathematically incorrect, it is a motivational nightmare. True leadership emerges from the realm of unreasonable expectations. So let's set targets that inspire us more to end global warming in a single score. Not only will humanity rise to the occasion, we will truly emerge as a United Nations. Now, the same three challenges to the accepted nuclear pedagogy. Evaluation, mathematical, and communication. Without fail, in common discussion, podcasts, conferences, our woes are always to be blamed on someone else. We claim that public perception is somehow holding us back. This evaluation is incorrect both logically and historically. Logically, this would presume that no other industry has figured out how to thrive in the context of negative public sentiment, which the chemical, textile, and weapons industries handedly disprove. Historically, couldn't be further from the truth either. Orders were canceled in 1978, before Three Mile Island, because nuclear was too expensive. Orders were canceled in 2008, before Fukushima, because nuclear was too expensive. Dozens of countries right now want this power so badly, but nuclear is too expensive. The public could not make it more clear. They want cheap energy above all else. And if you deliver upon that promise, they will rationalize why they like it. Just like we've rationalized clean coal, natural gas, toxic solar panels, and hydro dams, which routinely promise to drown thousands at a time. Public perception is a self-defeating excuse that nuclear engineers use for not building a cost-competitive product. The mathematical error of the nuclear industry regards frame of reference. When we consider our obligation to public safety, we take too narrow a view. Thinking only of our short-term mandate and ignoring the downstream consequences of our actions. We focus so dogmatically on radiation, setting limits 10,000 times lower than we have any proof that anyone has ever been caused by harm because better safe than sorry. But in doing so, we knowingly force the public towards alternatives that are orders of magnitude greater in hazard. The public doesn't run a probabilistic risk assessment to choose their infrastructure. But we do assume that the experts crafting our rules consider the risks across all options, optimizing for net benefits on our behalf. Facilitating real air pollution deaths in order to avoid hypothetical radiation ones is a total dereliction of duty. Fukushima proved three times over that the meltdown of a gigawatt scale light water reactor couldn't so much as manage to hurt a single person. Not only was the plant deprived of every single safety system, but one such system, the containment dome that we all love so much, in fact made things worse. Also, let us never forget, it was not contamination that deprived people of their land. It was the totally unnecessary evacuation. In 2011, we finally had proof that a light water reactor 
in the worst of circumstances poses zero threat to public health. What more do we need to know to stop classifying a nuclear accident as a unique hazard? As nuclear experts, we like to think we're so special that with higher safety standards, we're saving more lives. And we are wrong on both accounts. If we decide to regulate nuclear the same as any other heavy industry, the resulting economics would put every coal plant out of business in just a few years. Even if you prefer another way to do this, the better option would be the one that can do it faster, as lives lost is a function of the existing alternate risk multiplied by the time that we wait, not the replacement risk at a moment in time. We have already robbed half the world of clean air, clean water, and the prosperity that comes with abundant energy because we have run the wrong safety calculus. We've let 150 million people choke to death in the last 30 years because we've forced nuclear to be more expensive than coal. Regardless of climate change, if we let our narrow-minded interpretation of public safety persist, future generations will judge us to be unconscionably myopic. Our next nuclear error is one of communication. How often have we heard the claim that better education would make the public view us more favorably? But how could this be? We have already been very effectively educating them through our actions that they should be terrified of nuclear. When the standards we set for ourselves are so much higher than the embodied hazards, we leave the public no choice but to rationally assume that the underlying threat is equally as high. Let our communication around handling nuclear waste serve as an example. The presumed threat is that this radioactive material could somehow enter the environment in a way that causes harm. This goes so widely unquestioned that most nuclear engineers erroneously assume this as well. Chernobyl demonstrated in dumping every radionuclide that could possibly come out of a reactor in the highest quantity imaginable, while they're at their highest radioactivity, that only one such radioisotope could adversely affect human biology. Some are long-lived, some are short-lived. Some are liquid, some are solid. But out of the hundreds of isotopes that could ever move through the environment, when put to the test, only one proved to cause harm. Not cesium-137, not strutinum-90, not iodine-129, not iodine-135, in the worst possible environmental contamination of radionuclides, only iodine-131 could even theoretically pose a threat. And by definition, after a few months, there's no iodine-131 left in nuclear waste. Could you even begin to imagine a more perfect waste stream, where after only a few months, you can just dilute what little there is left to render it totally harmless? This case is sadly emblematic, where our nuclear waste experts pay billions of tax dollars to do so, thinking that they're helping, enthusiastically took on the challenge to protect the public for millions of years. But what they did was miseducate the entire world, including most other nuclear engineers, that nuclear waste is dangerous for millions of years. But that's not all. As with nuclear waste, we've run the exact same type of communication campaign with nuclear safety as well. The more that we invest in protecting the public from non-existent threats, the more threatened they will feel. Our ability to communicate is already incredibly strong. Actions speak louder than words. Now, despite all this gloomy rhetoric, 
I'm in fact more optimistic than ever. I've spent the last two years interviewing over a thousand nuclear experts across technology, economics, industry, policy, and more. There is no other group that I would rather trust the future of our planet to. Masters of physics, chemistry, mathematics, engineering, operations. The only thing that's held them back so far is that they've been too good at what they do. And what they've been focused on has been the wrong problem to solve. So here's my roadmap for the future. In order to rid the world of climate change, we need to rid the atmosphere of a trillion tons of CO2 while increasing energy access and affordability to everyone. Not only is nuclear the only power source that is capable of doing so, but if for once we focus our efforts on economics over radiation protection, nuclear will ride the same experience curve to ever lower costs as every other product made at scale. Within just a few years, it will not only be 100 times more prevalent but an order of magnitude cheaper as well. And with that much energy, we will restore the world to a garden of Eden for everyone, for all of time. Clean air, clean water, prosperity without restriction. But our mindset must change, and so must our diction. Tens of thousands of gigawatts of atomic energy. Climate change is formidable, but so are we. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brett. I've rarely heard an audience so quiet. You either terrified them or they were really interested. <laughs> Okay, does anybody have any questions? We have time for maybe one or two questions. Yeah, at the back over there. Hi, Sam Ha from the UK Atomic Energy Authority. I think you're being intentionally controversial in an attempt to meet somewhere in the middle, so I'm going to skip to meeting in the middle. Don't you think that it would be more sensible that instead of taking nuclear regulations which are way too high, to coal regulations which we know to be way too low to make them meet in the middle. What I'm saying is that we have not achieved our objective of public safety with nuclear regulations. The entire concept needs to be rethought. Uh, Dominic Hüpplinger, Austrian Nuclear Society. Uh, my question is, where should we start and how should we start? I think that's the uh, biggest problem here. In the last couple of months, I've been traveling the world, and I'll be doing so for the foreseeable future, meeting with potential stakeholders across industry, utilities, government, and regulators. If there is a single country that is willing to overhaul the concept of nuclear regulations and focus on net public benefit over absurd levels of radiation protection, which by the way, especially for the regulators in this room, every one of you has the sovereign right to do on your own, then we will march towards this vision where we have unlimited prosperity for all humankind. Okay, um, I will formally end the session. Thank you very much, Brett.